So, um, I'm Emily Peasgood. I'm a sound artist and a composer, and I make installations and sculptures. And uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Mark Hanslip, and I'm a uh, musician and data scientist ish. <laughs> <laughs> so. I have, as a creative person, a really big preoccupation with making artworks about death. I've done quite a lot of interactive graveyards where you can make voices come through gravestones, through sensors, and it sounds really morbid, but it, the aim is really to focus on how fragile and short life is and try and create something that makes people really think about that and be in the moment. And I, I also make a lot of artworks about farting as well. but. I'll <laughs> I, I put them in jars and things and sell them and put the sound in the jar and yeah, but that's a different talk. <laughs> uh, this talk really is about uh, creating Eversong, which is a piece that I got an idea for three years ago. I, um, I wanted to see if it was possible to write a piece of music where at the start the singer was five years old and as the piece progressed you could gradually hear them age and then at the end they were 95 and maybe even after that have a kind of after song where the voice keeps aging um, in cyberspace and I didn't know how to do this but I've always been really fascinated with how um, what sound can tell us about the world in what is a really visual culture and I think innovation in sound art is about that question what can it really tell us when we take visual information away and we, we focus purely on sound and sound can tell us a lot about things it can tell us um, obviously about directions about where things are coming from about safety about the shape of the source that's making it and also about the age of the person that's making it and so I had this idea to create this piece where the, where the singer aged through the song and I wanted to create it for environments that had a clear pathway so I was thinking this could be really interesting in a tunnel that you move through or perhaps in subways, also in transport hubs or, or maybe on escalators or in tube station um, tunnels. I thought it would be really cool to do something like this in all of those transient spaces where we move through the world on autopilot and don't really think too much. We just we know we're going somewhere. And so, yeah. I thought that would be a great environment and I started to think how can I make a piece I suppose that questions our legacy as humans moving into a digital age and that makes us really think about life and I've been really fascinated with artificial intelligence for a while but not in a positive way I thought it was pants and I didn't want anything to do with it I also thought what if uh, what if I suppose what if AI replaces people like me who create but then I thought it could be useful if it's a tool for helping me create something that wouldn't otherwise be possible at all in any other way, that isn't replacing people, but that could maybe do something that I can't do otherwise as a creative person, which is how I uh, started speaking with Mark about this project. So the first step in creating a song that sounds like the singer is aging is to get some data, to meet with some singers of all different ages and to create some, some data that we could then train to, to, to sort of do some aging. <laughs> so I decided that I wanted to do a, do a song that was a lullaby because lullabies are sort of the cyclical, they're interchangeable with life and death and I researched about 20 lullabies and decided I'd have singers of different ages sing these lullabies and then we'd have a nice big do vocal data set. And I did an open call and about 368 amateur singers got in touch with me, which was loads. 100 of them sent me a recording of them singing one lullaby so I could listen to them with some friends and maybe think who could this, what age is this singer, how, what age could they represent and we all listened blind with a spreadsheet writing down how old we thought each applicant was which was really interesting in itself and chose 18 singers that whose voices really blended and sounded really good together. They sounded like they could be one person and they also sounded a bit like me and the, the end goal of this was that we would train some data and map my voice onto, map them onto my voice, so I'm the constant, but I have their timbral qualities as I sing, so I can sound five and I can sound 90. And um, for context, these data sets, um, that this method is used by Holly Herndon's Holly Plus and Grimes Elf, they use voice transfer, but this concept is developed considerably making it possible to hear a voice age in real time 
And I want to just play you a segment of, well, one song, one of the lullabies that we recorded, um, where you can hear, this is untrained, this is just the raw audio, from youngest to oldest. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Mommy's gonna buy you a mockingbird. And if that mockingbird don't sing, Mommy's gonna buy you a diamond ring. If that diamond turns to brass, Mommy's gonna buy you a looking glass. If that looking glass gets broke, Mommy's gonna buy you a billy goat. If that billy goat don't pull, Mommy's gonna buy you a cart and ball. If that cart and ball turn over, Mommy's gonna buy you a dog named Rover. If that dog named Rover don't bark, Mommy's gonna buy you a horse and cart. If that horse and cart fall down, you'll be the sweetest little one in town. It's quite creepy, isn't it? I think it's quite creepy. <laughs> What was really interesting is when I was recording all of the data sets with people is we, we, me and my friends who listened to them, we, we didn't know how old they actually were. And one day a, a young girl came to the door with her mum and I was expecting her mum to be the singer because it was the 50-year-old voice and it was the 17-year-old girl. So there hasn't really been any, well, any major correlation between actual age and vocal age. We had a 7-year-old that sounded 50 were it not for the fact that you could really hear that they were seven in the way that they spoke and pronounced things. So it was really interesting doing this. I'm going to pass you over to Mark. He's going to talk about how we have then trained this data to create a uh, model. Oh, hang on. Yes. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about the processes that we needed to go through from these data sets of singers of various ages to eventually creating a model that would enable us to pass Emily's voice through the weights of that trained model um, and transform her voice into singers of various ages. Um, so you've, you've heard all of the data collection. Emily did the very onerous task of recording all of these singers um, in a reasonably consistent way as well. Um, I impressed on her how important it was to have consistent recording quality if you're going to try and model this data. Um, so then my easier job, I guess, was uh, to sit at home and uh, first pre-process the data. Um, so I'm going to talk about the steps to go through and then I'll get into each step in a bit more detail. Um, so the first step is uh, just data pre-processing, data cleaning essentially, which isn't the most interesting part of the process, but um, any data analyst or data scientist will tell you that it's a huge part of the job and it's really important when you're modeling audio especially, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the modeling process with this architecture that we found that does singing voice transfer really effectively um, called DDSP-SVC. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the inference process, which is kind of machine learning speak for taking an unseen input and passing it through the trained weights of the model. <coughs> Excuse me. So data pre-processing, um, like I said before, when you're working with audio, I mean it's important with any data modeling, but with, when you're working with audio it's really important. Um, because what I've found with kind of generative models of audio in particular, if you have any gunk in the data set, any kind of incidental sounds, um, or if you treat it in a certain way, then quite often what comes out of the model really exaggerates those features. Um, so it doesn't necessarily hear what we hear. Um, so to that end, the first step was just to curate the data sets for quality. Um, so just making sure that there weren't any extraneous sounds like background hums, um, knocks on the microphone, that sort of thing. Um, so we just selected the cleanest sounding tracks. 
And then to get them all sounding more or less the same, it was really important to normalize the data. Um, and when you're working with audio, there's a, a few different ways to do this. Um, you can do peak normalization, which is taking the maximum level of the signal, scaling it to a value, and then scaling the rest of the audio accordingly. Or you can do loudness normalization, which is a more perceptually motivated approach. Um, that's where you set a um, target average loudness in decibels across the audio sample. Um, I actually went with peak normalization because it seems to work fine. Um, many people consider loudness normalization to be better. It's, it's a sort of debate, exciting debate in the audio ML community. Um, so then we concatenate the data, um, so we kind of stack it horizontally into one long audio file and then segment it into three second chunks. Um, I think I also did a bit of silence removal as well. Um, so that's kind of that's the initial data cleaning part. There is actually additional data processing once this segmented data arrives at the model architecture. Um, so this slide could have been data pre-pre-processing. Um, but I'll talk about the other steps in a minute. Um, so the model architecture that we're working with is called DDSP SVC. It's a very catchy name that stands for <coughs> Differential Digital Signal Processing Singing Voice Conversion. Um, so let's talk about the first bit. Um, so the DDSP part, that's kind of quite a generic name. You could say that any sort of audio modeling with machine learning is differential digital signal processing. Um, but it actually refers to a specific model architecture developed by Google's Magenta team. Um, they're a small team within Google who um, create machine learning based tools like VST plugins for musicians. Um, and it's essentially a, um, a way of estimating synthesis parameters from a monophonic input using machine learning. Um, the singing voice conversion part of the model um, consists of a diffusion model uh, that we train ourselves. That's actually the only part that we trained. Um, and it's, a, it's an image model that takes a spectrogram input and learns to reverse a, a noising process. Um, so I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then at the end of the chain, there's, um, there's an old-fashioned vocoder. Um, they were very popular in the 80s for like speech coding tasks. Um, but it happens to be a machine learning based vocoder. It's a, it's a type of pre-trained GAN, um, which stands for Generative Adversarial Network. Um, so we, like I said before, we didn't really train this part of the model. It's a pre-trained model, but given that it's kind of the backbone of the whole process, it felt important to kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, so the DDSP process takes a monophonic, as in one sound, audio input and turns it into a set of synthesis parameters. And it does this by extracting um, F0 estimation, which is pitch. Um, so it extracts all of the frequency bands present in the audio signal. Um, it also does a bit of transient modeling through noise, um, and it also analyzes the loudness of the input. So that's the encoder part of the model. Um, and then the decoder part of the model outputs um, a set of um, frequencies that are then mapped to oscillators. So those os oscillators take care of all of the frequency content within the signal. Um, it also outputs filtered noise vectors and their role is to kind of model the transient portions that happen at the beginning of a signal, um, that happen at the beginning of a note when we play a musical instrument. And those have been historically really hard to model. Um, so if anyone's ever tried playing the saxophone sound on an 80s keyboard, they'll know that it sounds nothing like a saxophone because those non-linearities within the signal are really hard to model. Um, and then they add a bit of reverb to taste at the end, because who doesn't like reverb? And then the output is this often quite convincing um, synthesis model that you can then either generate new material from with MIDI inputs, um, and you can also use it for timbre transfer, which is what we're using it for. Um, so I'm going to play you a couple of sound samples. I'm a saxophonist by trade, I guess. Um, so this is me playing saxophone and then I'm going to turn my sound into a, a tuba. <laughs> Thank 
And here's the DDSPA-fied version. So as you can hear, it's still a bit kind of synthy sounding, um, but it's definitely more convincing than a typical um, synthesized instrumental sound, and that's because of um, you know this differential approach, um, modeling the non-linearities in a more real way. Um, so like I said, the DDSP model is pre-trained, then the outputs of the DDSP model eventually are piped into a diffusion model, which is what we do train. Um, Briefly, the diffusion process. I'm not super familiar with diffusion models. I haven't worked with them directly apart from in this project. Um, but they're generally image generating models um, that learn to generate images from a, a random noise input. And during the training process, they do this by deliberately adding random noise to the input and then learning to reverse that process. Um, they're very popular these days. Uh, Mid Journey is a really popular example of, of a diffusion model, which is like a text guided um, image generating engine. Um, in our case, we are converting the audio input to spectrograms, which are um, image representations of audio. Um, so they, they follow time along the y axis and frequency on, uh, sorry, time along the x axis, frequency along the y axis. Um, so the first bit of processing of this part of the pipeline is to turn the DDSP outputs into spectrograms and then, um, and then clean that output up. Um, so we train the diffusion model on our um, data sets of, of singers. Um, that was the most hands-on part of the process. Um, so post-modeling, um, we then try out what we call inference in machine learning speak, which is passing an unseen, previously unseen input through the weights of the trained model um, in order to do something. Um, in our case, vocal timbre transfer. Um, so the full process is we take Emily's vocal sample, um, we pass it through the weights of the DDSP model, which was pre-trained. That outputs a kind of noisy, synthy version of Emily's input. Uh, we then convert it to a ML spectrogram. The trained diffusion model cleans it up. And then we pass the output of the diffusion model through this pre-trained GAN vocoder model. And um, in the best case, we end up with a, with a nicely transformed voice, uh, which Emily will play you some samples of now. Um, so we've, we've got mixed results. This is our, this is our first multi-voice model that we trained. And you'll probably hear at the beginning that the very youngest voices, these go from it youngest to kinky. oldest, yeah. sound a bit odd. They sound really um, odd. But there is a tangible aging effect. Um, one thing to consider is that when we eventually install this in a tunnel, it's really important that the voices um, blend properly. Um, so if we'd done this just with the pre-made recordings, it, it would have involved a lot of tweaking to try and get those in tune and in time and in sync. Um, so while this might sound more uniform, it is kind of what we're going after for the installation part of the project. Yeah, and it's, it's essentially me singing all the way through, but then we apply different aged models to my voice. So, and, and, But at the end, you'll hear them all sing together, and it sounds like a homogenous chorus effect, which is a testament to how similar I think all of them are. So. Yeah, let's have a listen. And um, yeah. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. <laughs> Mummy's gonna buy you a mockingbird. If that mockingbird don't sing, Mummy's gonna buy you a diamond ring. If that diamond turns to brass, Mummy's gonna buy you a look. Looking glass. If that looking glass gets broke, Mummy's gonna buy you a billy goat. If that billy goat don't pull, 
Mummy's gonna buy you a cotton bowl. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Mummy's gonna buy you a mockingbird. So that's where we're up to on the voice transfer front. Yeah, I mean, the next steps are to keep tweaking it. We've got another one more model to do with somebody that's an age group we haven't done yet. And I um, am going to be composing an original lullaby for the project. One of the really interesting things that we had when we did this project was that lots of people were really... Well, we did the open call for amateur singers, but professionals did apply, and they were quite annoyed when I emailed them and said, I'm going to be using um, deep learning on this project. Um, and these are some of the emails I got. <laughs> there was just a general consensus that, that AI was bad. Um, and I, I get it. I think the concern really was that some of the professional singers thought that um, we'd create a model that could replicate them and then they wouldn't have any work because there'd be a digital version of them online that people could just get without them having any income even though we explained that isn't something we're going to do. So that was a really interesting output and something we're going to sort of keep looking into, I think. Yeah. yeah, it was a bit of a teachable moment because we probably could have been clearer in the call-out that we didn't intend to share anyone's data outside of the bounds of this project. And I mean, it's, it's hard to know how much kind of thinking went into these responses. They feel very sort of like good responses, AI bad. Um, but... Really what I, what I think they were worried about is their voices ending up in some kind of large generative model. Yeah. That would only have happened if we'd shared their data publicly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, ultimately what this is going to be, this project, this is all the behind bits, but it's going to appear really simple. You're going to walk through a tunnel or down a path and hear a singer that, who, who will age in real time. And uh, hopefully I'll write a piece of meaningful music that they'll be singing. Um, we, are, we are going to be going shortly to the drop-in workshop, which is opposite workshop two. If you would like to have a go at singing or talking into our model, you could hear yourself when you're younger and when you're older. So we'll probably be there in about And in some cases, ten minutes. Another, another gender. Yeah, you might be another gender, because we, we, we're still working on the version for guys. But <laughs> we can put you down an octave. So. We, we currently only have female vocal. Models. Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you would like to, to come uh, and have a go, we'll be there in about 10 minutes, opposite workshop two. And yeah, I think uh, we, we're, we're at the point now of it's been very generously funded, this project, by well, Oxford Contemporary Music, the Composers Fund, PRS gave me a grant to write it, and Guildhall School of Music, where I'm a sound art professor, um, and also an, a, a software company who won't let me put their logo on things, but they have given me money to pay all of these participants properly for their time. Um, so, yeah, it's been a great project, and we hope to start touring it next year, and if any of you are rich and want to help us produce it, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.